Well, thank you very much for that. <coughs> Nature is popular today. She's the cool kid at the lunch table, the one everyone wants to hang out with and be seen hanging out with. On IMDb, four of the top 10 highest rated TV shows are nature documentaries. Every year, books that popularize the latest scientific findings about this weird world we find ourselves in top the bestsellers lists. Our songs, poetry, and art routinely explore the beautiful fabric of the universe. Our national parks are often so packed with visitors that they can be almost painful to visit. And lots of weird people like me somehow find it enjoyable to spend some time every year sleeping under the stars and swatting mosquitoes. To this we must add, of course, all of the literature and lectures devoted to concerns about the impact of human development on this world and its climate. Putting all of this together, it would be hard to argue against the idea that nature is one of the hottest topics around today. Beneath all of this interest in nature, though, lie some fundamental differences in what we think about the kind of thing that nature is. For some, the universe is a mystical place filled with a kind of numinous presence. Others approach the universe more as a science project, something to be probed and explored as we delve ever deeper into its inner workings. And many continue to view the world primarily as a resource to be developed and utilized for the purpose of fulfilling some vision of human flourishing. And we could go on almost endlessly, since I sometimes think that there are as many different ways of viewing the universe as there are people to do the viewing. For our purposes, though, the key is to recognize that every answer to the question, what kind of thing is this universe that we find ourselves in, comes with significant implications for how we go about trying to understand the world, what we think it means to be human, how humans should relate to the rest of the universe, and how we should go about pursuing the flourishing of ourselves and the world around us. Now you might think that questions like these would be largely resolved once we step into the sphere of Christian thought about the world. And to some extent, you'd be correct. After all, even though Christians continue to debate about the interpretations of particular texts or the means by which God brought the world and its creatures into its existence, Christians do share significant common ground on core convictions like the fact that God is the creator, that we consequently need to understand the universe fundamentally as a creation, that the universe thus has an essentially theological meaning and purpose, and so forth. With these shared convictions, we have significant resources for reflecting together about what creation is and how we should understand it. Nonetheless, what I'd like to do today is explore a significant fault line in Christian reflection on the nature of creation, focusing primarily on the human person as a test case for thinking about creation more broadly and the implications this has for how we understand ourselves and the flourishing of God's creation as a whole. The fault line I have in mind involves differing perspectives on the nature of nature, how nature relates to grace, and how these differences shape our vision of creation. We'll begin with an acorn, a hammer, and my pathetic carpentry skills. People have long maintained that if something is teleological, in other words, it has a telos or an end that provides its reason for existing, then you cannot really understand the nature of that object apart from knowing something about that telos. One classic example of this focuses on the nature of an acorn. If I asked various people what an acorn is, I might get a number of answers. Some might focus on the acorn as a food source, possibly for squirrels wife, on the other hand, would probably see it as a potential fall decoration for our dining room table. And I can almost guarantee that my middle school boys would view it as something that would make an ideal projectile to be hurled at any number of nearby targets, particularly of the feline variety. Yet I'm sure that most would focus on the real telos of the acorn, which is growing into an oak tree. In other words, on this account, you can't really understand what an acorn is unless you know that its nature is to grow into an oak tree. The telos is intrinsic to the meaning of the acorn. 
Similarly, it is relatively common to think about the flourishing of a given object in terms of its telos. If I know that the ultimate end of an acorn is to grow into a beautiful oak tree, then I can assess the extent to which that acorn is flourishing based on whether or not it is effectively moving toward that end. And I can assess the various factors influencing the acorn based on the extent to which they are hindering or contributing to that ultimate outcome. If I don't know the telos of the acorn, however, this becomes much more difficult. How exactly am I to assess whether the acorn is truly flourishing? or if the factors around that acorn are contributing <laughs> to its flourishing apart from some concept of that toward which the acorn is supposed to be moving. Apart from some kind of telos, it begins to seem somewhat arbitrary to suggest that any one state is intrinsically superior to another, a mere matter of preference or pragmatics rather than a statement about the true flourishing of the acorn itself. Of course, the proper end of an object does not have to be something developmental like this. Take, for example, a hammer. I would assume that the proper end of a hammer is to be used for the purpose of hammering, which is something the hammer is capable of as soon as it comes into existence. And if we want to use the language this way, it's possible to say that the hammer is immediately capable of flourishing insofar as it is being used toward its proper end. In both of these examples, then, the telos in view is pretty obviously intrinsic to the nature of the thing being considered. Those who are much better at the science than I am could probably sit us all down and explain precisely how the blueprint for the oak tree is a part of the very structure of the acorn. We could analyze precisely how various capacities intrinsic to the acorn get actualized through the course of its development, such that it eventually grows into the giant oak tree that I'm sure is currently dropping leaves all over my yard. And it's not terribly difficult to conceive of how the structure of the hammer intrinsically enables it to be used for the purpose of hammering. We might thus refer to all of these as natural ends, things that can be accomplished through the intrinsic capacities of the object alone. It would not be too difficult, though, to imagine an object with a telos that was not something it could achieve merely through the use of its own imminent capacities and powers. Suppose, for example, that I decide to build a pergola in my backyard. And suppose further that I did this as a gift for my wife, which I can guarantee is the only reason I would build a pergola in my backyard. The ultimate end of the pergola then is that it be gift for my wife. Even if someone else built an identical pergola with all of the same intrinsic qualities, it would still not have the same ultimate telos because it would no longer be gift for my wife. And I suppose we can even imagine some super hypothetical world in which I built an identical pergola in my own backyard, but did not do it as a gift for my wife. Such a pergola would have a different telos. In other words, in situations like this, an object has a telos that it cannot achieve merely through the actualization of its own powers. Such a telos is supernatural. It transcends that which is achievable based on the natural alone. And that is precisely how most Christian theologians understand the nature of the human person. Although theologians differ with regard to the details, most maintain that the true telos of the human person is to arrive at some state of intimate union with God in Christ through the power of the Spirit. And that this ultimate state is something that only God can produce as a gift of His grace. <clears throat> Even without the fall, humans would have needed to receive this ultimate end as a gift of God's grace since no creature can produce intimate union with God merely as an expression of its natural powers and capacities. Thus, the human person has a supernatural telos, achievable only through grace. Similarly, many theologians maintain that creation itself has a supernatural telos. While still affirming that the universe was perfect from the moment of creation, in the sense that the universe was just what God wanted it to be from the very beginning of the story, God always intended to bring creation into a higher state, an even more perfect state. Many find hints of this in the creation account itself, which calls for humanity to be fruitful and multiply so that God's image bearers might spread and manifest God's presence throughout the earth, continually increasing the sphere in which God's people exercise dominion over God's creation, extending the reach of Eden to include all that God had made. On such an account, then, the eschatological transformation of the creation that we find promised in the prophetic literature and the New Testament 
is a declaration that God still intends to bring creation to the telos that was his purpose for creation from the very beginning. Yet this eschatological state involves things that cannot be produced merely by the actualization of the natural capacities of creation. Things like the outpouring of the Spirit, the impossibility of sin, and the permanent manifestation of God's glory. Consequently, this eschatological telos must be viewed as a supernatural end rather than a natural one. Based on this, it would seem relatively straightforward to claim that humans and creation can only be understood in terms of their supernatural telos. After all, remember what we said earlier about how knowing the telos of any object is fundamental, both for understanding the kind of thing that it is and what it means to say that that entity flourishes. Consequently, if the true telos of the human person is intimate union with God, and if that is a supernatural telos, in other words, one that must be received as a gift of grace and cannot be achieved through the exercise of natural powers alone, then we must conclude that one cannot understand humanity or human flourishing apart from some knowledge of this supernatural telos. However, if we go down this road, we run into a few small problems according to critics of this approach. First, saying these things robs grace of its graciousness. Second, we just denied Nicaea. And third, we can't talk to non-Christians. All right. We'll see a bit later whether we are, there are ways to respond to these concerns, but first I'd like to make sure that we're clear about the nature of the worries so we can appreciate why some find it necessary to pursue alternate approaches. So first, the idea that this robs grace of its graciousness. If humans are essentially defined by their supernatural tela such that one cannot be human apart from being oriented to this end, it begins to sound as though God would somehow be obligated to provide this telos to humanity. The only alternative seems to be imagining that God could create humans for the sole purpose of eschatological consummation and then withhold from them the grace necessary for achieving it. This would result in a humanity perpetually frustrated by its inability to fulfill its own finality. And it seems unfitting for a good and gracious God to leave his own creatures without even the possibility of attaining the telos for which he himself created them. God thus seems to have an obligation to his creatures one that he established by instilling in them a telos they cannot achieve through the actualization of their natural capacities. Yet if God is obligated to provide eschatological consummation, it no longer appears to be grace, since people commonly maintain that grace cannot be obligated. The second concern arises from the idea that we cannot know what it means to be human, apart from the supernatural telos that is only revealed in Jesus Christ. According to Stephen A. Long, the logic of Nicaea depends on our ability to discern that the Son became human, which requires that we know at least something of what it means to be human before the Incarnation. As he says, quote, to hold that human nature is not intelligible in its species in distinction from grace is to make the Nicene doctrine, the doctrine that in Christ God assumes a who knows what, Indeed, it would seem that the logic of the biblical narrative itself suggests that knowledge of what it means to be human comes before knowledge of our supernatural telos. And the third concern suggests that viewing the supernatural telos as intrinsic to the meaning of humanity undermines the viability of interdisciplinary and public dialogue about what it means to be human and how humans flourish. After all, this position maintains that we can only understand the essence of humanity when we have some knowledge of our supernatural telos. Yet it seemed reasonable to think that no non-theological discipline could possibly have any insight into such a supernatural telos. Consequently, it seems to follow that non-theological disciplines have nothing of significance to offer with respect to what it really means to be human, and consequently nothing meaningful to say about what it means to flourish as a human person. So to get a feel for the alternative, we're going to visit Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Since these seem to be rather significant obstacles, one option would be to explore other ways of understanding the relationship between humanity and its supernatural telos. The most prominent alternative being the one offered by a variety of Thomas. This view requires us to make a fundamental distinction between nature and grace, maintaining that the natural rather than the supernatural perspective offers our best avenue into understanding what it essentially means to be human.
This distinction has also played a fundamental role in grounding much of the Catholic tradition's discussions of natural law and public discourse about human flourishing. To begin, we need to understand how nature differs from grace. And here, we need to be careful. For many of us, the word nature, particularly when used in distinction from grace, sounds like a reference to some kind of purely secularized understanding of the world, one that tries to understand the universe without any reference to the creative activity of God as a gracious expression of his will. Yet, that's not how the term nature functions in this conversation. For those theologians involved in this discussion, as Edward Oakes explains, nature typically denotes, quote, what is essential to something's identity. To have a human nature is to have whatever it is that is essential for being human rather than some other kind of creature. Grace, on the other hand, refers to something that is not essential. What is gratuitous to the entity in question, but comes to it as something extra, unexpected, or not required for a nature to be a nature. Consequently, nothing about this distinction requires us to view nature as a secular concept. Since nothing exists apart from God's work in creating and preserving the universe, nature must fundamentally be viewed as a gift as well. Yet, once God brings something into existence, it has a certain set of properties essential for it being the kind of thing that it is, which includes a certain set of powers that allows it to accomplish ends appropriate to those powers. That is its nature. Grace involves anything that goes beyond those essential characteristics. This distinction, whoops, there's nature, there's grace, leads us directly to the idea of a pure nature, which is the concept of humanity apart from this elevating grace. Now, although we could explore this concept from a number of vantage points, I'm going to try this one. Steve Rogers, also known as Captain America, now, if you're not familiar with the story, Steve was born as a regular, albeit rather scrawny human. He thus had all of the capacities and powers essential to being human, though these were, of course, expressed in the particular ways that make him a unique human individual. And in this state, Steve has a particular telos, one which includes him growing and maturing as a human person. However, Steve also receives superpowers. As a result of a World War II science experiment, in which all of his human capacities are enhanced to perfection. Consequently, he now has a new telos, one that transcends what is achievable on the basis of his natural uh, powers alone. We can thus make a clear distinction between Steve's state before the experiment, regular, and his state afterward, enhanced. The former state is Steve's natural state, which is his human nature, what his human nature is like prior to and apart from any reference to the enhancements. And the enhanced state is clearly a gift of grace, since it is not something he could have approved, uh, produced through the mere actualization of his natural powers and capacities alone. He's not going to go from point A to point B with like nutrition and exercise. Consequently, Steve's enhanced state is supernatural. Now, one way of imagining the story of humanity is to suggest that it is similar to this scenario. On this account, God first created Adam and Eve in the garden in a natural state. In this condition, they would still have had a telos, but it would have been one that could be achieved through the actualization of their natural powers alone. Here, many prefer to appeal to the idea that Adam and Eve would still have been capable of loving God, but this love would have been limited to whatever kind of love of God can be achieved through natural powers alone, without any additional and transformative gift of grace. After creating humanity in this initial state, God then called humanity to a higher telos and gifted them with the grace necessary for achieving that higher state, much like Steve Rogers was elevated to a telos that exceeded what he could achieve on the basis of his natural powers alone. This gift of additional grace was lost at the fall, returning humanity to its natural state, but it can now be restored in Christ through the Spirit. We thus have one way of telling the story that involves a clear chronological distinction between these two states of the human person, the natural state and the elevated state of grace. Yet this is not the only way to understand how this uh, natural state argument might work. Returning to the Steve Rogers analogy, imagine the story had worked out differently. 
Suppose that instead of waiting until he was an adult to perform the experiment, some scientist figured out how to transform Steve from the moment of his conception. On this new story, there was never a time in which Steve existed in a purely natural state. Instead, that the enhanced state was implied from the beginning. Nonetheless, his natural condition would still be that of regular human, because that is what he would have been, apart from the transformative gift that raised him to a higher level of existence. Even here, then, we can talk about Steve's natural state, though dis the distinction will now be entirely logical and abstract rather than chronological and historical. In other words, on this scenario, we actually begin with knowledge of Steve according to his supernatural state, along with the conviction that such a supernatural state must come as a consequence of grace. And these two convictions require us to maintain that Steve must still have a natural state, even if it was never actualized in history. On this account, then, the natural state is a logical abstraction, albeit an important one. Additionally, we can also say that although Steve now has a supernatural telos, there is still a sense in which he still has a natural telos, the end that is proportionate to his regular, unenhanced natural capacities. So, for example, even though Steve now has super-enhanced hearing and can discern sounds and tones not perceptible to normal human ears, he can also sit and enjoy a Bach concerto in precisely the same way as the rest of us. He thus has two distinguishable sets of ends, one proportionate to his natural capacities and one proportionate to his supernatural state. Returning to the story of humanity then, most of those affirming this kind of nature-grace distinction maintain that the natural state of humanity is abstract in precisely the same way. Rather than thinking that there was ever a time in which humans existed in a natural state devoid of the higher calling of grace, they contend that God both created and elevated humanity at the same moment. Consequently, this supernatural telos applies to all humans who have ever lived. But this does not mean the natural state is without relevance. The fact that humanity has received this higher calling as a gift of grace entails that this additional gift is something that transcends human nature rather than something that is essential to it. Consequently, if we want to understand what it really means to be human, we must think albeit abstractly, about humanity in the natural state. And just like in the example of Steve Rogers, even though we have all been called to this higher telos, we too retain the natural ends that are proportionate to our natural powers. This is important in this context because it means that even those who have not been united with Christ and are thus unable to pursue their true telos still have a legitimate set of natural ends that they can pursue. Consequently, Christians can partner with non-Christians, to promote at least a limited kind of human flourishing in pursuit of these natural human ends. According to its proponents, then, such a position avoids all three of the errors mentioned earlier. First, it maintains the gratuity of grace, because nothing about this suggests that God was in some way obligated to provide this supernatural state to humanity. Instead, it remains entirely conceivable that God could have created humanity in a natural state and have chosen to leave them in this state allowing them to pursue their natural telos, maybe some kind of natural love for God. Second, it affirms the logic of Nicaea by maintaining that knowledge of what it means to be human logically precedes knowledge about the higher state offered in grace. Even if we think that God called humanity to the new supernatural state from the beginning, it remains the case that what it essentially means to be human is something that we determine on the basis of humanity's natural state rather than the elevated state of grace. And finally, this view seems well positioned to engage in public and interdisciplinary dialogue about what it means to be human and to flourish as a human person. Although only the theological perspective can understand humanity according to its supernatural telos, every discipline has something valid to offer for understanding humanity in its natural state. The task of theology then is to take the natural knowledge of humanity offered by these non-theological disciplines and understand it in light of what it knows about humanity's supernatural telos. <clears throat> now, there's some problems down this path as well that we should be aware of. 
So before we move on to look specifically at how our original view might respond to the three concerns we've raised, it's worth noting that the nature-grace distinction we've been discussing faces a number of important difficulties. Protestant theologians have traditionally worried that the nature-grace distinction involves some kind of incipient Pelagianism. This stems from the idea that human persons have a legitimate telos that can be pursued through the right exercise of their natural capacities, independently of the gift of grace. For those whose ears have been attuned by Augustinian concerns about Pelagianism, this sounds dangerously close to the idea that God has already given in the act of creation everything necessary for humans to pursue their legitimate telos. Consequently, common grace alone is adequate for salvation. In other words, before the ele uh, elevation to his enhanced state, Steve Rogers had a regular human nature complete with a natural telos that could be fully achieved through the actualization of his natural powers alone. Although Steve may not be able to achieve the higher level possible through the elevated state of Captain America, he can achieve the essential telos of humanity without any additional gift. To many, this sounds like some kind of salvation by works. Now, one could try to respond to this concern by pointing out that most of those who affirm this position maintain that all existing human persons have actually been called to the higher supernatural telos. Consequently, it is not the case that any actual human person has ever been able to achieve their higher telos, or their essential telos, apart from the gift of grace. However, although this response is correct, it kind of misses the point, because it does not address the fact that even the hypothetical possibility that a human could achieve their true telos through the application of their natural powers alone raises the Pelagian concern. A better approach would be to argue that this criticism makes the mistake of failing to distinguish between pre-fall and post-fall states of humanity. Properly speaking, any talk about the salvation of human persons must refer to a post-fall reality since it requires a state in which salvation is required. Properly speaking, then, the debate about Pelagius only regard, uh, arises with regard to a system that thinks even fallen humans can achieve their legitimate telos apart from special grace. If the natural state advocate wants to maintain that it might have been possible for, before the fall for human persons to achieve their proper telos through the application of their natural powers alone, that would seem to be something that must be addressed using a different template than the one provided by the Augustinian Pelagian debates. A second concern traditionally raised by Protestant theologians has to do with the idea that our natural powers and capacities remain after the fall, and that we can still exercise those natural powers in pursuit of human flourishing. Protestant thinkers have routinely heard this as indicating that these natural powers were essentially unaffected by the fall. From their perspective, the nature-grace position, this makes it sound as though the essential substratum of human nature is largely unaffected by anything that happens at the level of grace and sin. Grace is merely something added to an already complete human nature. So the essential human nature suffers no real loss when grace is removed after the fall. We retain all of our natural powers and can use them effectively to pursue human flourishing. However, contemporary advocates of this approach have clarified that this is a mistake. Although human nature retains all of its natural powers, as it must if it is to remain distinctively human, that does not mean that human nature is unaffected by these various transitions. Suppose, for example, that I exposed my daughter to the glories of coffee for the first time. In her natural state, she had never been exposed to coffee, so her natural desires could be adequately fulfilled in other ways. Now that she has been elevated to the higher state of coffee lover, however, she will remain unfulfilled and unsatisfied by anything else. She still has all of the same essential powers and capacities, but they have now been oriented to a higher desire. Now suppose, in addition, that I decide to rescind her coffee drinking privileges for some reason, probably because she kept taking my coffee with her to school and leaving me with an empty pot. She has now lost the higher order state that she had received as a gift from her gracious father. And she still retains all of the natural powers and capacities she had before her coffee elevation. Yet these powers and capacities are still ordered toward a higher end, such that they can no longer be satisfied with lower pursuits. Her essential nature remains, but it does not remain unaffected. 
According to advocates, the same holds true for this natural view. Although they affirm that we retain our natural powers and their corresponding ends despite the fall, they deny that this requires us to think that these powers have been unaffected by the corrupting influence of sin. In addition to these two classic objections, however, we should also be aware that more recent criticisms of this view have come from a variety of theological traditions. Although quite a number of Catholic theologians have registered their concerns, Henri de Lubac's arguments have been the most influential. According to de Lubac, this approach fails to appreciate that the biblical authors clearly portray Jesus as the one in whom we find the true meaning of humanity. This is particularly prominent in the New Testament emphasis on Jesus as the true image of God. As Paul simply declares, he is the image of the invisible God. Given that theologians have traditionally seen the Imago Dei as a fundamental statement about the meaning of humanity, if Jesus is the image of God, then we cannot possibly understand what it means to be human in isolation from this essential Christological truth. Consequently, he contends that this kind of nature-grace distinction results in a view of humanity cut off from its transcendent finality, rather than recognizing that the supernatural telos of humanity is inscribed upon my very being. <clears throat> de Lubac and others have also argued that a theological understanding of the human person should begin with the concrete realities that exist in the world that God has actually created rather than attempting to derive an understanding of humanity on the basis of a purely theoretical abstraction like the natural state. And in this world, the only kind of humanity that we have is one that has always already been called to the ultimate telos in Christ. Although we do have natural capacities and desires, they are themselves oriented toward this supernatural telos, such that there can be no true happiness or fulfillment for humanity apart from eschatological consummation. Consequently, since even pre-lapsarian humanity was oriented toward this ultimate telos and had an innate desire for this finality, de Lubac cannot countenance even the hypothetical possibility that God could have left Adam and Eve in that state without offering them the grace necessary for their only true telos. Rather than envisioning a state of natural bliss, de Lubac argues that only suffering would have resulted from such a situation, since it would leave humanity with a desire, indeed their deepest desire, that would never be fulfilled. He also rejects the possibility of a hypothetical universe in which humanity exists without a supernatural telos at all, contending that such creatures simply would not be human. For de Lubac, we cannot define humanity in abstraction from the supernatural telos to which God has actually called us. Consequently, no matter how similar some other creatures might be in this hypothetical scenario, they would not count as human. As an example of a contemporary Protestant critic, we can turn to Catherine Tanner. In addition to some of the concerns raised above, Tanner argues that the entire discussion is based on the Aristotelian conception that natures must have finalities that are proportionate to their powers. So in this context, if humans have natural desires, they must correspond to finalities that are achievable by the powers of their human nature. Consequently, if we think that the supernatural telos is intrinsic to the meaning of humanity, we either imply some kind of Pelagianism or we undermine the gratuity of grace. To avoid these unacceptable implications, then, we have to posit a natural state that is not intrinsically ordered toward a supernatural finality. Yet Tanner contends, that the mistake is in assuming this Aristotelian framework in the first place. Tanner instead offers a participationist ontology of the human person in which the human desire for God does not even arise from human nature at all, regardless of whether that nature is viewed as being in a state of nature or a state of grace. Desire for God is always produced by God's presence to us in and through the Spirit. Ultimately, she argues that the nature-grace debate has locked itself into irresolvable difficulties by orienting the discussion around a faulty conception of humanity and its relationship to God's grace. And finally, a similar concern arises from Eastern Orthodox perspectives on the discussion. With their highly sacramental understanding of the universe in general and human nature in particular, Orthodox theologians tend to avoid making any strong distinctions between nature and supernature. As Vladimir Lasky notes, the Eastern tradition, quote, knows nothing of pure nature to which grace is added as a supernatural gift. For it, there is no actual or normal state, since grace is implied in the very act of creation itself. 
We could easily add more voices and concerns here, but this suffices to help us see why theologians from various traditions, Protestant, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox, have reservations about the legitimacy of this kind of nature-grace distinction and consequently its viability as a basis for talking about the meaning of creation or human flourishing today. What about the three worries? <clears throat> first, on divine obligations. The first concern, as I mentioned earlier, is that the supernatural approach undermines the gratuity of grace. This suggests that God would be obligated to provide the grace necessary to achieve humanity's supernatural telos if it is, in fact, essential to humanity. However, if God is obligated to provide the grace necessary to achieve the supernatural telos, then it cannot be grace, since grace cannot be obligated. Now, some might be inclined to reject this argument simply on the basis of a conviction that God cannot ever be obligated to his creatures. Even if God created humanity with an intrinsic orientation toward eschatological consummation, we might maintain that this does not mean he now owes it to his creatures to provide what is necessary for achieving that end. If he does, that is simply a gift of grace that goes beyond the gift of creation. Imagine, for example, that I create a robot for the sole purpose of carving pumpkins. And I instill into the robot all of the capacities necessary for carrying out that purpose and no other. Then when the robot is ready, I decide not to give it any pumpkins, depriving the robot of the gracious gift necessary for it to carry out its purpose. Would this create some kind of injustice? It's hard to see why it would. People might wonder why I would waste my time building the robot if I had no intention of allowing it to carry out its intended functions. But there's no good reason to think that I'm somehow obligated to do so, even if I eventually discard the robot because it is not carrying out its pumpkin carving purpose, this is still well within my rights as the robot's creator. Although I think it's probably right to argue that God cannot be obligated to his creatures simply in virtue of having to create them, or having created them, the reference to God's goodness earlier suggests that there's another form of the obligation argument that might be more difficult to address. Maybe the relevant obligation is something that obtains between God and his own purposes. If God created humans for a particular telos, it would seem to be part of his own plan that they, or at least some of them, actually achieve this telos. While this might not create an obligation between God and the creature, we might argue that God is obligated to himself. In other words, to carry out his own plans. The only alternative would seem to be the possibility that God could abandon his own purposes, which would open the door to all kinds of worries about God's faithfulness and his reliability. Yet if God is in any way obligated to provide the supernatural telos, even if the obligation is to himself, we still seem to have the problem that the supernatural telos of the human person is no longer a gift of grace, but the demand that comes from obligation. Catherine Tanner contends that the problem with this entire way of thinking is that it assumes some kind of sequentiality in the divine decisions. In other words, it assumes that God first decides to create humanity in condition A, and then sequentially decides to elevate humanity to condition B. The question then arises about the relationship between these two decisions. However, as Tanner points out, we cannot make such temporal distinctions in the eternal determinations of the divine will. She rightly critiques any attempt to think of one divine decision as having a kind of influence on the other, as if it unfolded in a causal sequence. Nonetheless, even if we reject any kind of causal or temporal sequence, it still seems reasonable to ask if some kind of logical relationship might exist that would still produce a relative kind, uh, relevant kind of divine obligation. And it seems quite possible to maintain that just such a logical relationship at work, is at work between the idea that God created humanity for his purposes and that God will, in fact, carry out his own purposes. If so, the gratuity argument still seems to linger. Alternatively, we could concede the point and affirm that grace and argue that grace can, in fact, be obligated in some sense. Instead, we might argue that it is at least conceivable for something to be both obligated and grace-based at the same time. Although this might seem like an impossible contradiction, Edward Oakes rightly points out that the same paradox accompanies any expression of love which lies at the heart of grace. As he says, 
For if love is the essence of grace, then something peculiar enters the picture here. We all need love, but love is not love if it has been coerced out of the supposed lover. What is the value of love if it is not freely given? Thus the paradox. We need love, but cannot demand it. Love is love precisely because it is a gift freely that is gratuitously given. Consider, for example, the relationship between a parent and a child. We all know that there is an important sense in which the child needs love if she is to flourish as a human person. So on the one hand, we want to say that the parent is in some way obligated to provide the love this child so desperately needs. Indeed, when we encounter situations in which the parent fails to provide the requisite love, for example, in situations involving child neglect, we rightly experience indignation. Something unjust has occurred when a parent withholds love from a child. At the same time, though, we also have a strong intuition that true love cannot be obligated. Although my children need love, I'm fairly certain they would not want to hear when I get home this evening that I love them because I feel I am obligated to do so. The same holds true for spousal love. Even though I made a vow on my wedding day to love my wife always, creating a form of obligation, I can only imagine the response if I went home this evening, gathered her into my arms, gazed into her eyes, and told her that I loved her out of a deep sense of obligation. In various circumstances, then, we have intuitions that lead us to conclude that the same act can, in fact, be both obligated and grace-based at the same time. It may be, however, that we can find an easier resolution in the covenantal idea that God can graciously obligate himself to perform some action. All of God's covenants find their basis in grace, since there is nothing that could obligate God to enter into those covenantal relationships in the first place. Having done so, however, God takes to himself the obligation to carry out the terms of the covenant. Consequently, there's a sense in which we can say that God is obligated to provide the blessings of the covenant in response to the people's faithfulness. At the same time, though, we must also say that the blessings are an expression of grace, since the covenant itself is grounded in grace. If we follow this path, we end up affirming that the obligation to provide the grace necessary for humanity's supernatural telos arose as a part of the same eternal act in which God determined to create humanity for that telos. So what about worries about the public discourse regarding human flourishing? Before we turn our attention to the third concern here, I want to address this one. Criticizing Hans Urs von Balthasar in particular, Stephen Long argues that this approach, the supernatural approach, robs nature of having any significant ontological density and intelligibility in its own right. In other words, by arguing that humanity is intrinsically oriented toward its supernatural telos, This view seems to deny that we can understand what it means to be human in any way, apart from a theological perspective. To understand how we might respond to this concern, let's go back to my wife's pergola. I should probably confess, by the way, that I have not built a pergola for my wife in the backyard and have no intention of doing so. Any such pergola would have certain properties that correspond to natural ends, things like providing shade, adding beauty, and showing off my barely existent carpentry skills. Additionally, I can discuss this pergola with someone who's an expert in pergola construction. And I would certainly have much to learn from such an expert, even if he knew nothing about the pergola's higher telos. So it would seem reasonable to think that the pergola remains abstractly intelligible in its natural state, even if its true meaning is only seen in light of its higher telos. It must be abstractly intelligible if the pergola construction expert can know things about it. However, nothing about the supernatural approach entails that we must reject the idea that non-theological perspectives might have much to offer about the nature of humanity or its various powers without any awareness of its supernatural telos. Like any created entity, a human person comprises a myriad of disparate parts and powers, each of which can be analyzed from numerous perspectives. A dermatologist can study the details of the human skin without thinking twice about whether that skin is covering a being who is intrinsically oriented towards some higher telos. And we might say something similar about the geneticist who analyzes human DNA, the endocrinologist who focuses on the various hormones that have such significant impact on human behavior, 
or any of the various sciences that study aspects of human existence. From the micro particularities of the human genome to the macro realities of our sociocultural context. The supernatural approach only entails that we see the essential meaning of the human person as a whole from the perspective of his or her ultimate telos in Christ. More importantly, though, this view does challenge the presupposition that even these so-called natural properties of the human person can be understood in abstraction, uh, understood fully in abstraction from humanity's supernatural telos. Looking back at the pergola again, once someone knows the true telos of the pergola, she begins to see that even the natural properties of the pergola differently. Understanding why I designed it to shade certain areas of the garden and not others, because those are places where my wife likes to sit. And why it's probably not the most attractive pergola in the world, because I made it with my own unskilled hands. Properties of the pergola that seemed available to analysis from a purely natural perspective now turn out to be dependent on the higher telos in ways that were not immediately obvious. Keith Johnson argues that a similar dynamic is at work in the theology of Karl Barth. Barth likewise affirms that the relationship between nature and grace can be known only retrospectively in the light of the knowledge of the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This retrospective movement allows for nature to be abstractly intelligible to a degree, but it insists that everything we think we know about humanity must be reinterpreted in light of humanity's supernatural telos. And Nicaea. This argument also provides resources for addressing this concern. If you'll recall here, the concern is that the creeds assume that we already know what it means to be human when they declare that the eternal son has become fully human. However, as we've just seen, nothing about the supernatural approach requires us to deny that we can know at least some things about humanity independently of knowing humanity's supernatural telos. That would be rather absurd in light of all the information about humanity generated by non-theological perspectives. Additionally, it's worth pointing out that the logic of the creeds only requires a rather minimal sense of what it means to be human. As D. Stephen Long points out, by the way, having Stephen Long and D. Stephen Long both writing on the same topic, yeah. <clears throat> uh, certainly, we cannot make sense of the incarnation if we cannot distinguish between the nature of a human being and that of a donkey. Yet nothing in the argument presented here suggests the absurd idea that we cannot distinguish a human from a donkey apart from the knowledge of humanity's supernatural telos. It only suggests that the latter is central to the definition of what it means, essentially means to be human in a way that the minimalist requirements of the former cannot. And we must also recognize the ways in which the creeds do not simply assume some kind of already established concept of humanity. Instead, they allowed their understanding of humanity to be reshaped and transformed by this climactically new revelation of what it means to be human. All right, now does any of this really matter? Probably not. We cannot conclude this discussion without reflecting at least briefly on some specific implications. Although I've already argued that the supernatural approach does not undermine our ability to engage in meaningful dialogue with non-theological perspectives on humanity, it may help for us to spend a few minutes thinking about precisely what this means. So, does any of this matter? Yes. Let me begin with the observation that a discussion such as this is likely to have implications beyond what we can immediately see. As I said at the beginning of the lecture, our vision of what creation is necessarily impacts how we interact with creation and what we think it means for creation to flourish. Consequently, any discussion that presses this deeply into the theological resources Christianity has for talking about what it means to be human and what it means to say that the universe is God's creation will inevitably shape discourse about those realities, even if we cannot immediately anticipate the ways in which it will do so. Pressing into the discussion a bit further, I can appreciate why many find the nature-grace distinction conducive to discussions about creation particularly those that take place in the public sphere. This distinction allows us to maintain, one, that the proper way of understanding any creature is to begin with what it is in its natural state, and two, that this natural state is fully accessible to both theological and non-theological fields of study. Consequently, theologians can and should partner with experts from the other disciplines to understand the essential nature of humanity and other creatures. However, 
Although this sounds like it would create excellent opportunities for interdisciplinary dialogue, the precise opposite often tends to be the result. Once we have distinguished nature from grace in this way, it becomes far too easy to envision the natural as a realm, as the realm of the sciences, and to relegate theological perspectives to the realm of grace alone. And since nature logically precedes grace in this framework, what often results is the expectation that the sciences will establish what creatures are and the theology will accept and build on this basic understanding of the natural realm restricting its constructive work to questions about the spiritual and or ethical implications of this data. In other words, the historical tendency has been to create a disciplinary bifurcation that undermines the interdisciplinary dialogue by making each sphere the proper domain of only some of the disciplines. Now, I don't want to go so far to suggest, as some have, that this nature-grace distinction contributed directly to the rise of secularism in the West. Nonetheless, I do think this approach has contributed something like, contributed to something like Gold's famous non-overlapping magisterial, the <clears throat> Noma, in which the voice of theology is restricted primarily to the realm of grace. To be fair to my interlocutors, none of them would intend or endorse any such attempt to separate nature and grace into isolated spheres of discourse like this. However, given that this is precisely the kind of separation that has been so characteristic of modern thought in the West, we would be wise to exercise vigilance in this area. Although critics of the supernatural approach worry that it undermines disciplinary dialogue, I contend that this approach actually provides the strongest possible argument for maintaining that theology must have a seat at the interdisciplinary table. The supernatural approach will necessarily resist the methodological presupposition that we should try to understand the natural independently of the supernatural. Instead, it will seek to interpret and reinterpret any data that we have about humanity and the rest of creation through the lens provided by our knowledge of that supernatural telos. Consequently, it will insist that theology actually has something to offer for understanding every aspect of human existence. And remember the analogy of my wife's pergola. According to that analogy, knowing the telos of the pergola provided insight not just into the overall purpose of the pergola, but it also influenced the meaning of so-called natural properties, like the pergola's size, shape, and location. Though these things are available to ana for analysis from non-theological perspectives, even particular details like this cannot be properly analyzed apart from knowing the pergola's supernatural telos. And finally, I'd like to register a concern that may sound like semantic nitpicking, though I hope it tugs at deeper strings. One of the perceived benefits of the nature-grace distinction is its ability to participate in public discourse about the flourishing of creation, and specifically the flourishing of human persons, apart from grace, special grace. As we noted earlier, some advocates of the nature-grace distinction maintain that humanity retains its natural powers and their corresponding ends through all the various transformations of human nature. And since those are natural powers and ends, they are publicly available. So Christians can partner with non-Christians to foster environments that promote natural flourishing, even as Christians continue to maintain the fundamental importance of the greater flourishing that is ours in Christ. My worry here is with the use of the term flourishing to describe any state of human existence outside of and apart from Christ. Although I agree that Christians can and should partner with non-Christians to improve the lived condition of any and all human persons in whatever way is possible, I think we should be very careful about the language we use to describe human existence outside of the grace we receive in and through Jesus. I worry that suggesting that it is possible for humans to flourish outside of Christ, even if we limit this flourishing to the realm of the natural, will be heard and oper operationalized by others as indicating that, we, that what we receive through Jesus is an optional, albeit beneficial, add-on to human existence, and that adequate levels of creational flourishing are available without him. To conclude a lecture that has probably grown too long already, let me simply state again that how we answer questions like, what kind of thing is creation? Or what is the human person? Matter for how we conduct ourselves as ministers of the gospel. Theological discussions about the relationship between nature and grace can easily sound abstract and esoteric. However, these are simply ways of asking about the essence of creation 
in the extent to which theological perspectives are necessary for understanding God's creation rightly. Whether I have parsed these discussions correctly is something we can pursue in the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the uh, stimulating lecture. Um, let me uh, just begin as you uh, ponder your questions. And we've got a microphone uh, to my left uh, and my right. So uh, please make your way to the microphone. Um, in, in many respects, um, just to sort of frame the whole thing, Mark, if we could, mm -hmm. um, this is a discussion or a lecture that, that would fit pretty uh, uh, well in a Roman Catholic setting, mm -hmm. often not as much in a Protestant, generally, or evangelical, much more specifically. When, when you look at the larger history of that, why? Why is that? Why has it not been uh, significant in the realm of, some parts of it have, but the nature-grace distinction not as much. Why, why is that? Yeah, I'm sure that, that there's a big answer to that question. Yeah. The two things that come immediately to mind are probably the fact that Protestants in general and evangelicals in particular um, have historically not made the doctrine of creation itself an area of significant and extended reflection. Yeah. Uh, so to that extent, we're just simply behind other traditions yeah. in thinking robustly about creation from a theological perspective. When you take that and kind of combine it with the fact that Protestants in general um, exercise a level of nervousness mm -hmm. about a discussion that talks about nature yeah. as much as it does. Yeah. Uh, that, that no matter how you nuance that or go about it, there's always kind of a worry that you're mm -hmm. undermining grace by emphasizing mm -hmm. nature to this extent. Yep. Um, it's probably similar to um, why evangelicals and Protestants have been slow to, to get on board with thinking about theological anthropology. Yeah. Kind of worries about anthropocentrism. So if we talk about humanity too much, we'll forget about God. If we talk about nature too much, we'll forget about grace. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions that we might have? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the bifurcation between mm -hmm. nature and the supernatural and how that leads to a sort of division for the, for the role that theology have and for the scientists. Mm -hmm. um, if we try to overcome that bifurcation, up to what extent do you see the role of theology playing in our understanding of the natural? Um, <clears throat> the tricky bit there is that you asked me to what extent, and so I'm, I'm wrestling a little bit with how to come at, because from one perspective, my argument kind of says that, that theology has something to say about every aspect mm -hmm. of nature. Um, so the, the, the scope of theology's inquiry into creation is, is pretty all-encompassing, so the extent is rather significant. Um, <clears throat> That doesn't mean, though, of course, that as a theologian, I'm somehow going to become a, uh, a master of physics in a way that the physicist cannot. Um, as a matter of fact, my knowledge of physics extends pretty much to knowing the word physics. <laughs> so what, kind of the framework that I'm putting together isn't to suggest that the theologian is now automatically an expert on all of the other disciplines, so much as that theology actually has something to say about all of these other disciplines. Uh, so that if there were physicists sitting down at a table um, who were excellent communicators and could get me to figure out what they're talking about, then as a theologian, I, actually, I can participate to and contribute in that discussion as I, as I reflect from my Christian perspective about the telos of creation and how that helps me understand things like quarks <coughs> and kind of how that fits into the broader purpose of things. Now, that, that conversation is going to unfold very differently depending on whether I'm sitting at a table of Christian physicists or non-Christian physicists. Yeah. But I actually don't think my role as a theologian changes in either of those two settings. Uh, that in both cases, I come to the conversation with the resources that I have, and those are Christian theologian. Uh, and so I'm going to bring that to bear on that particular conversation. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I apologize in advance if this sounds too masters of suspicion, but <laughs> I, I have to ask, to what extent do you think uh, the desire for a, a hypothetical um, pure nature um, is funded by the desire to, uh, the, the aim to enforce a politics. Um, mm -hmm. Since that historically happens uh, with some regularity when that is posited, uh, maybe that's too psychological, but. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I, I'd be hard pressed. We're, we're humans, which means that we're going to take pretty much any concept and figure out how to use it in the most broken way possible. Uh, so I would be surprised if that hasn't happened, where people use nature grace kinds of distinctions uh, to fund particular political moves. Uh, that would seem reasonable to me that we would do that kind of thing. I would need to be pretty convinced, though, that there's something essential to the nature grace for it, like that that move itself is fundamentally about politics and power and control. Um, I certainly know that most of the theologians who use the nature grace distinction would say that that's not at all on their radar and what they're doing. So it would take a lot of background work to, to make the case that that's actually happening, even though the people making the move don't think that's what they're doing. No. <clears throat> Any other questions? Actually, you could probably make a legitimate argument that the supernatural okay. approach could be used to fund political um, uh, moves as well, uh, right? So as a theologian, if I, if, if I had some desire to exercise more power in the world, probably the best way to do that is to say that I have something to say about everything, right? So that I have kind of the, the be-all and end-all perspective on the universe. That could absolutely become a power play in its own right. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, over here, please. Uh, thank you for your lecture, first of all. Um, so just a question. In answering the previous question, you spoke of sort of a, a negative view of, of when mankind gets a hold of things, they're going to kind of ruin it to yeah. some extent. Uh, and you also talk about the absolute need of Christ for flourishing. So how do we reconcile that with the need to be seated at the table? Um, because I guess I kind of wonder how helpful is our theological voice going to be in that climate? So kind of just the, the reality of what humanity is, and then our voice yep. among that, and how, you know, is there is there a higher goal of reaching that community, or, or I don't know if that makes sense. It does. So it kind of goes the, the to what extent do these various positions have kind of a practical bearing on the way we participate in these conversations mm -hmm. about human flourishing? Uh, <clears throat> And I do, can I go back to my conversation with the non-Christian physicists? If I'm sitting down with, with uh, my neighbors and we're gonna have a conversation about what, what kinds of things can we as a neighborhood do to produce greater flourishing in the community, um, I'm not inclined to think that my proper role in that conversation is to set aside my theological perspective on creation and what it means to be human um, and attempt to participate in that conversation on some other basis. Uh, so much as to just readily and forthrightly acknowledge that this is my starting point, this is fundamentally how I understand creation and what it means to be human, um, and that's going to lead me to these conclusions about what contributes to human flourishing in this neighborhood. Uh, they're going to put their own perspectives on the table, uh, but to, to some extent there's a bit of a hopeful optimism mm -hmm. in my understanding of how these conversations work that um, uh, rather than thinking that that, would, that way of approaching the conversation would lead to kind of dead ends in the process, that actually leads to more fruitful discourse than trying to find some kind of lowest common denominator. Uh, that, that we, we may find things that we can agree on, but they're not going to take us very far, um, as opposed to uh, kind of putting our best thoughts on the table about creation and humanity and trying to operate on that basis. So, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so it seems implicit in uh, particularly the point of discussing theologians entering discourse with uh, non-theologians um, and scientists on this issue, on a lot of these issues of human flourishing. There seems implicit moments where uh, what theology has to offer would seem to directly contradict what the natural sciences would have to offer. Um, and begging your analogy of that wooden structure, the name of which I can't pronounce. Um, <laughs> It would seem that if you dis, uh, discuss with an expert carpenter, he might suggest, well, it'd be better if you put it over here or if you build it facing this way. He might have some corrections mm -hmm. to which you would respond, well, because it's for my wife, these different things benefit her best, though they seem contrary to the normal way you would want to build this. Yep. <clears throat> um, likewise, where, where do you see, uh, the, how do you see those uh, contradictions flushing themselves out in this kind of public discourse? Yeah. One of the mistakes that I think we could make here, to go back to kind of using things badly, is this could easily lend itself to a kind of theological triumphalism, mm -hmm. where the theologian is always right, and we get to dictate to the other disciplines what they, how they understand the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's worth pointing out that, that the framework itself doesn't require that, right? because it's entirely possible that even if I've, got, uh, if I've understood correctly the, the telos of the human person, 
and that that should be the starting point for understanding a human person, there's still kind of a, a, a logical move that I have to make from here's the telos to here's what it means for understanding humanity and human flourishing. And in that I'm making the move from point A to point B, it's always entirely possible that I've done it badly. Right? Not that I shouldn't do it, but that I've made a mistake in stepping from point A to point B. Uh, so to use the pergola analogy, um, I decide to locate the pergola in a particular place because I think the telos of the pergola requires me to put it there. Like That's in the best interest of the gift for my wife telos of the pergola. Then my pergola construction friend comes along and says, yeah, if you put it there, it's going to fall down. Um, and you put it back up, it's going to fall down again. Uh, that, I don't know, something about the ground, in quicksand, I don't know. Um, so he, he has information that he kind of places before me. Now, I do want to have, if I'm going to be kind of true to this being the right way to, to end, engage the conversation, I want to have, I need to have the ability to push back, right? Because I have a viable perspective uh, to contribute here. If this is an interdisciplinary dialogue, then he needs to be able to put something on the table, and I need to be able to put something on the table back. So it is possible that I'm going to come back to him and say, no, I'm pretty sure you're wrong about this, mm -hmm. uh, and that my perspective as a theologian uh, is going to require me to go in this direction. But if it's going to be an interdisciplinary dialogue, right, where we're both contributing to the process that, that's happening here, I need to be willing to say, maybe I made a mistake when I moved from A to B. Maybe this isn't the only place that I can locate the pergola based on the pergola's true telos. Uh, and so I need to revisit my own thinking about the significance of the telos for how we understand humanity and human creation uh, so that um, I'm open to the, the, that which is being contributed to the conversation by the other party. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one here. Yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned the Eastern Orthodox viewpoint in your talk. Yep. Um, could you describe that again and show how it's different from the position you're espousing, and, and especially why you think it might be wrong? Um, I, d I wouldn't necessarily say that I think it's wrong. I rather intentionally didn't go too deeply into the Eastern Orthodox perspective just because it, it, it is a radically different perspective on how all of this works out. And it has to do with their thoroughly sacramental understanding of creation as a whole. So that all of creation is kind of permeated with divine presence such that really any aspect of creation can become a, a sacrament uh, in, in that sense. Um, and so if that's your, your way of understanding creation, then just the whole conversation about how nature relates to grace is a non-starter. Because there is no nature that kind of even logically exists independently of grace. Everything that exists simply is a constant moment by moment uh, manifestation of God's own presence in the world. Uh, so so that, that kind of, I moved through it quickly just to say, kind of know that there is another perspective out here that rejects. Uh, it's a little bit similar to the Tanner approach of I'm going to reject this conversation because I think the conversation started on the wrong foot to begin with. Uh, that a nature-grace bifurcation is the wrong way uh, to participate in this. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Let me end in this way. Let me ask one final question. As the, the Scripture and Ministry Lecture Series is bridging the academy and the church. Mm -hmm. um, how would this e either parallel or be the same as or be different if you were to be sharing this lecture with a bunch of pastors? Uh, those, those providing leadership in a local church. And we've got yep. some that are trained here for that and some that are, mm -hmm. uh, and faculty members that are, are training them for that. So how, how, would, yeah. how would you do that? Yeah, I actually realized about halfway through reading the paper that a bit I should have put in here at it's, some point okay. um, is just what human flourishing means, mm -hmm. uh, and at least the way that I use the concept. Uh, so that if human flourishing, if, if we, the way we talked about it is humanity has a telos, uh, and as I've defined it, that telos is intimate union with God in Christ through the power of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that is what it means. So what it means to flourish as a human is to be rightly moving toward that telos or rightly living in light of that telos or however it is that we want to say that. Uh, then human flourishing is just a different language mm -hmm. to describe what we do in all kinds of different contexts. Right? So that pastoring is working with humans to promote their flourishing as human persons. <clears throat> Parenting is working to promote the human flourishing of your kids. Uh, teaching is an act of human flourishing. Counseling is an act of human flourishing. Basically, any time that you are working with, with human persons in such a way that you are attempting to move them toward a state of, of betterment, if you want to use a different language, that that is working to promote human flourishing. Mm 
so all it would want to do is kind of take that human flourishing language, yeah. which can sound a bit secular to us, and um, uh, kind of remind us, actually part of the argument of my paper is there's nothing secular about the concept yeah. of human flourishing. That the very concept of human flourishing is to be and to be continually becoming the kinds of things that God has created us to do, which makes it an inherently pastoral, ecclesial task. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one, one final question then. Please come on up here, uh, use a microphone. So I hope I didn't like totally miss a really important point, <laughs> now I'm asking it again. But um, <clears throat> so, if two people approach a topic with different pre presuppositions of the telos of mm -hmm. humanity, from the perspective of a secularist or non-theist, uh, what does the theologian offer the secularist beyond secularist explanations? You said, well, we have a vi viable perspective too, so we can offer some pushback. But it seems like we can only offer pushback on their deepest philosophical convictions and not on the surface level of science. So I'm wondering, um, yeah. Actually, I'd be inclined to say I can do both. <clears throat> uh, that as a, what, kind of what, I, what I bring to the conversation as a theologian, isn't just about kind of fundamental presuppositions, although that's where conversations often take place. Um, but if, if, I feel like I'm building way too much off of this pergola that actually doesn't exist. Uh, but if that analogy kind of works at all, right, the conversations can actually take place about interpretations of very specific pieces of data. Uh, now granted, that's gonna take some education on my part, right? Because uh, I pretty much guarantee if I'm sitting at this hypothetical table full of Chris, uh, physicists, um, I'm not understanding enough of what's taking place here to actually offer a meaningful theological voice to the conversation. Uh, but if I did, then the conversation can actually be not just about their fundamental presuppositions as non-Christians of whatever kind of non-Christian they are, but we can have conversations about how they're reading and interpreting very specific pieces of data. They're going to do it from their perspective. I'll be doing it from my perspective. So I think we can converse about all of those kinds of things. Now, one of the difficulties is, is that a lot of the conversations that um, I find taking place in our society don't value that way of approaching mm -hmm. interdisciplinary dialogue. Uh, they don't necessarily want me coming into the conversation mm -hmm. speaking as a theologian. Um, and to be quite honest, lots of people simply aren't convinced that I have anything meaningful to contribute to those kinds of conversations. Uh, but at that point in time, we're actually not having a dialogue. Right. So my, my way of kind of engaging this uh, um, um, assumes possibly overly hopefully that I've actually found some people who want to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, now to be fair to them, part of the reason why they often don't want to engage in dialogue with people like me is because of the fact that theologians have um, at times been bad dialogue partners. Yeah. Right? That we don't want the give and take that we're mm -hmm. calling for, uh, that we're asking them to contribute. So I have to engage the conversation willing to dialogue and recognize that they may not want to have that kind of conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, for the lecture. Uh, let's thank him one more time. <laughs>